With everything that's happened in the last few years, from the devastating tsunamis in Asia to the earthquakes in New Zealand, South America and Haiti, the flooding of New Orleans, the attacks on 9-11, the wars in the Middle East, the worldwide economic crisis, a lot of people are starting to wonder if something really big might be coming down the pike. Today, we're gonna to look at it from one of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible. Don't you go away, I'll be right back. and you recognize the name Harold Camping. He made international headlines last year when some of his followers put up billboards predicting the apocalypse on May 21. Well, actually, to be more accurate, they said that beginning that day, there would be five months of brutal plagues. Millions would die, and then on October 21, the world would come to an end. Of course, you probably noticed, it didn't happen. So, Mr. Camping adjusted his calculations, set another date for October, and that was wrong too. So, what I find fascinating about this story is not that somebody predicted the end of the world. I mean, that kind of stuff happens all the time. What is fascinating is how much airtime the secular media gave to the story. Why in the world did this story make international news? Is it because Harold Camping's organization was so effective in publicizing his theories? Perhaps. Or maybe it got traction because somehow the story just went viral and people enjoyed making fun of him. Or did his announcement ring our bell for another reason? Underneath the laughter, is it possible he was making us just a little uncomfortable? After a long string of natural disasters, about a decade long, culminating in that massive Japanese tsunami, after 9-11 and the collapse of our global economy, is there some tiny part of us wondering if Harold Camping might be wrong about dates and details, but in some ways, right about something? After all, you do find a lot of people talking about this year, 2012, as the likely year for the destruction of our planet. Did the ancient Mayans really predict the end of the world for this coming December? Did Nostradamus predict the appearance of an Antichrist in 2012? You might laugh about the idea, but you'll notice that booksellers and movie makers aren't laughing. They know we'll buy their stuff and make them millions. So why is it that we have this awkward sense just beneath the surface that something really might be going on? You know, the world makes fun of biblical Christianity and Bible prophecy, but in the same time, we line up in droves for apocalyptic movies like The Day After or 2012, and they only halfway laugh about it because we have this uneasy sense that it might actually happen, which tells me something about our collective sense that not all is well here on planet Earth. Today, we're going to look at something more reliable than popular books or blockbuster movies. We're going to set the stage for a deeper understanding of the key prophecies of Daniel, and we're going to look at the words of Jesus himself. We'll explore that all-important question, is there really an end? And if there is, just how close is it? But just before we do that, let's take a look at the Bible in the news. Late last week, as you probably heard, an Italian cruise ship carrying more than 4,000 people ran aground just off the coast of Italy. As of this morning, 11 were dead and more than 20 more people were missing. And the captain right now is being raked over the coals for what appears to some people to be a cowardly response to a very big mistake. The reports of the accident are more than a little unsettling. While the passengers were sitting down to dinner, some reports say, they suddenly heard a very loud noise and their cutlery started flying off the tables. The lights went out and the ship quickly started tipping over on its side. Francesca Sinatra, one of the people on board, described what happened inside the ship as people began to panic. I can easily understand, she said, how it must have been on the Titanic. There were people scrambling all over each other and elderly people actually started to wet themselves. 
According to a story that ran on the BBC, the crew failed to show passengers how to evacuate the ship, and they were planning on a practice drill for the afternoon after the accident. And you know, that makes me wonder how people might have survived if they'd done the drills before they needed them. And how many people might have survived if they knew the ship was deliberately off course and headed for danger? So you're asking, how does the Bible factor into this story? Well, today we're going to be looking at a passage that gives clear indication that our planet and the human race are headed off course. There are rocks just beneath the surface of the water, and things are taking a turn for the worse. And you know, back in Jesus' day, the early Christian church took this prophecy very seriously, especially the portions that related to the book of Daniel and applied directly to them. When the Romans sacked the city 40 years after Jesus, the Christians were all in their lifeboats, and not a single one of them died in the disaster. Now, of course, that was then and this is now. And the biggest part of that prophecy applies to us more than it did to them. And the question is whether or not we're going to know where the lifeboats are when we need them. A good friend of mine used to say the future might not be kind to the uninformed, and in this case he was absolutely right. The track record of biblical prophecy, the track record of the book of Daniel, is so stunningly accurate that we'd be crazy not to pay attention. For centuries, well-informed Christians haven't been surprised by much because we have a prophetic roadmap of the future that's never been wrong, not even once. And that means when the next big crisis hits, there's no need to panic because there really is a way for you to face it with perfect peace of mind. Now, just in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to our guest. Gary Gibbs, the Vice President of Hope Channel, is with me tonight. It's kind of like having the boss drop by to check up on the show. And then a little later on in the show, if the miracle of technology doesn't fail me tonight, John Bradshaw from It Is Written is going to join us too. So don't you go away. We're going to be starting again before you even know it. Today, Gary Gibbs is with me on the program, well-known author, speaker, and vice president of the Hope Channel. It's almost like corporate is sending in a spy to make sure I'm not embarrassing the Hope Network. But really, seriously, he's a good friend and a great Bible scholar. Gary, I'm just delighted that you're on the program with me tonight. Well, it's good to be here, and corporate is not spying on you. <laughs> no, they're not checking me out no, to make sure doing, that I'm not you, you preaching heresy. Great job, good stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Well, listen, you know, tonight we're going to be taking a look at a chapter that some people call the Little Apocalypse. I've heard mm -hmm. it called the Olivet Discourse. It's really Matthew 24, and I guess to some of the viewers that might seem like a funny place to be when really we've been working our way through Daniel and Revelation, or at least that's the intent of the program. Is there a reason we ought to stop and pause and take a look at Matthew 24? Probably the best reason ever, Jesus said, <laughs> we need to study Matthew 24 in connection with Daniel. In fact, it's right here in Matthew 24, verse, uh, I, like, I like to read verse 14, uh, because it talks about the time in which we're living right now, Sean. It says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This is Jesus predicting the last days. Right. And, you know, as we look at this, I think you'll, we'll see a lot of this is being fulfilled in our time. But in that context, verse 15, the last days context, Jesus says, therefore, in, in other words, it's a connective word to the previous verse. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, and then he pauses, he, what he was saying, spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. So it's like he's, he's saying, now, wait a minute. I want you to get this. If you live in the last days, you need to be reading Daniel and connecting it with what I'm telling you right here. That's why you need to study Matthew 24. So there's, there's an actual biblical, scriptural connection. This chapter ties directly to the prophecies of Daniel. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, it's really one of the punchiest chapters in the entire Bible. It's 51 verses long, and there is no way tonight we'll get through 51 verses. But uh, this chapter, if you read it, it kind of takes your breath away, and it's kind of this temperature gauge that lets you guesstimate how close are we getting to the end? Is Jesus really coming? But before we go into it in any kind of detail, I want to ask you an important question, because anytime I read about the second coming of Christ, I get excited, mm -hmm. and, and most Christians do. And it's tempting, once you read this, to go back to Daniel, go back to Revelation, mm -hmm. and get out a chalkboard and start drawing timelines and try to figure out a little more detail. You know, let's put a date on the second coming of Christ. Guys like Harold Camping, 
I mean, he didn't get it from Matthew 24, but he did pick a date. Where do these guys get it wrong? Well, I'll tell you what he did right. He picked a date. That was my wife's birthday. Oh, no So kidding. at least he got her birthday right. Did you go out and get a present? <laughs> we certainly did. You did. You didn't bank on, on the no, apocalypse. No, okay. in fact, we, were we would listen to the program on the way to church every Saturday morning. They have a children's program. On, and even the children's programs were predicting Jesus is coming back May 21st. So right. I made my own prediction right here on Hope Channel as well as with my family. It's not going to happen. Now, I was right. He was wrong. What's the difference? I think the difference is right here. It would, didn't take being a theologian or a rocket scientist to get, get my prediction right, because Jesus said here in verse 36 of Matthew 24. Okay, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no man knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Well, there it goes. He you can't get day. plainer than that, right? No, you can't get plainer than that. Now, I should probably mention that I'm not questioning Harold Camping's sincerity. I'm not questioning... The, the, the Christian commitment of many people mm -hmm. that are involved in the radio station, but this was a pretty big blunder, and it could have been prevented. It could have, and, and I think it, um, it actually had some negative uh, connotations on the whole Christian community. It makes us look like a bunch of buffoons who you know, predict these dates and nothing happens. So when we come along and we share real prophecy, properly, you know, exegeted and understood, right. then people say, oh, no, those are the people that predict dates and nothing happens. No, so it you can't pick the us. day or the hour, but why not May? I mean, it doesn't say month, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think his intent is, is pretty clear there. Yeah. You Actually, know. a little later on, just before Jesus goes back to heaven, I think he says to the disciples, it is not for you to know the times, times or, the, or seasons. the seasons. He just rules out anybody who says, That's okay, right. he didn't say year, he didn't say month, didn't say decade. That's he right. sure did. I guess basically it boils down to this. The the exact time is none of our business. We need to be ready every day because, you know, your, your, our time might come, people fall, you know, dead, a heart attack or whatever. Uh, we always need to be ready for Jesus. Well, where do we get this urge then, I mean, to, to set dates? I mean, I, I've already kind of revealed that, yeah, it'd be nice to know. I'd love to put it on the calendar. Where does that urge come from? I think we want to be in control, Sean. I, mean, I think you're right. You know, I think we want to be in control. If we can control the environment, the more we know about it, then the more secure we feel. But I think Jesus is actually challenging that, saying, have faith in me. Because Christianity is all about having a personal relationship and a faith that we can trust God when we don't know what's going on, we can trust Him. And that's really what it's about. And we need to do that in whatever age we live. Okay, let's dive right into it. I, I concur. It says right here in Matthew 24, verse 1. We'll start right at the head because this sets the table for the whole chapter. It says in 24, verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and His disciples came up to show Him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. This is the first prophecy in this chapter, and, and really this is one that's already taken place, hasn't it? A remarkable prophecy. It took decades to build this temple, and uh, it was still under construction in Jesus' day. And the massive stones weighing multiple tons, just one stone. And Jesus says, not one stone left on top of the other. And it was fulfilled to the letter in 70 A.D., so what, what happens in 70 A.D.? I mean, that, that's a big, big, big year. Well, there was a lot of tension between the Romans and, and the Jews. The Jews constantly went through these different revolts. And so there was a, a revolt, and the Romans came in to squash it, and they surround the city, and they uh, attack the city. I mean, they sieged the city for years on end. People were starving inside. They ate all the animals. They were eating their shoe leather. They were eating their kids. No it, it was horrible. Yeah. And so finally, when they get in there, even though they had an order not to burn down the temple because it was such a magnificent building, the soldiers had such pent up rage that somebody throws a firebrand in there and the thing goes up like it's been soaked in gasoline. I think I've read this in the writings of Josephus, a, a contemporary mm -hmm. historian at the time. So they throw a, a torch in, the zealots are hiding in the temple, poof, thing goes up. All the gold in it, it's covered with gold, melts down into the crevices of the rocks. Later on, the soldiers come by and they pry the rocks apart, literally, to get the gold out. And in that sense, not one stone is left upon another. A remarkable prophecy fulfilled, what, 30 years after Jesus, or 40 years after Jesus yeah, predicted it? Roughly 40. Mm -hmm. it's, it's remarkable. So not one stone left upon another. And uh, here's something I find really interesting. Um, that temple, of course, has never been rebuilt. The only thing left of the temple complex to this day is the Wailing, the Wailing Wall there in, in Jerusalem where people still put their prayers right. in the cracks between those few stones that are not part of the temple building but mm -hmm. 
part of, part of the wall. And, uh, and here's the interesting thing that I find about that. The temple no longer exists, and yet I hear a lot of preachers say that temple's got to be rebuilt before Jesus can come again. It's going to be there again. We only have a couple of minutes before the break. Can you, in a couple of minutes, tell me, is that in this prophecy, yes or no? Will the temple be rebuilt if it's here in Daniel or Matthew 24? Is it there? Well, it's not. It's not. It, you just think about Matthew 24, all this detail about what is going to happen, when it's going to happen. And if the rebuilding of the temple is so critical to last day prophecy, surely it would be mentioned. I mean, Jesus mentions everything else, but there's not a word from Jesus' lips on the rebuilding of the temple. Interesting, because actually when the temple was sacked the first time, this is the second temple that's destroyed. That's correct. There are promises in the Old Testament when the first temple is destroyed that it will be rebuilt, that there will be another temple, and the glory of the latter will be greater than the glory of the first, and so on. But it's silent here, isn't it? Not a single word here. It's really a misinterpretation of prophecy coming out of Daniel 9. If we have time, we can look at that later. But uh, yeah, it's a misinterpret, a grand misinterpretation right. of prophecy. Daniel 9 probably be a whole show for us. We'd probably spend some time there. You know, another thing that I've noted is what would be the point of rebuilding the temple? Hebrews 10, I think it is, verse 4 says that the blood of bulls and goats had no effect. It was all symbolic of Jesus dying. Why would we reinstitute a sacrificial system after the death of the real Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? And most Jewish uh, people today, they, they don't even like the sacrificial system. You know, it's bloody, it's gory, they see no point in it. So that, why would they even participate in it? So we really don't find anything in the Bible to suggest that it has to be rebuilt before Jesus can come again. There's, there's nothing there. Okay, well, the disciples hear about the destruction of the temple, and they jump to an interesting conclusion in verse 3, and we're probably going to have to come back to that after the break. But in, in verse 3, it says, Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They seem to connect it, mm -hmm. uh, the rebuild, or the destruction of the temple, rather, with the end of the world and the second coming of Christ. And We'll have a chance to get to that in just a minute. And in a few minutes, you're going to get your chance to jump into the discussion. So here's what you need to know to join us. HopeTV.org slash disclosure has all our information. 888-730-HOPE or 4673. You can SMS at 707-200-1099. Now go get your iPad, your laptop, your phone, because sometimes it gets busy and you want to get on this right away and join the discussion. And coming up in just a moment, Pastor John Bradshaw joining us live from Las Vegas. Today I'm with Pastor Gary Gibbs, Vice President of Hope Channel, and we're studying the little apocalypse prophecy of Matthew 24. And in just a moment, you can join our discussion. Go to hopetv.org slash disclosure to get the details you need. You can call us at 888-730-HOPE, that's 4673. Or you can send me a text message at 707-200-1099. And if you're living overseas, I'm afraid you have to phone us at 707-200-1099 too, uh, because I can't foot the bill for 800 calls overseas, at least not today. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, you find all the details at the website. And now, joining us live from Sin City, Nevada, Pastor John Bradshaw, Speaker Director for It Is Written, an international ministry with a nearly 60-year pedigree behind it and a ministry that's dear to my heart. John, welcome tonight. How are you doing there in, uh, How are you doing there in, uh, in Sin City? In Sin City. Doing well. Thank you. Nice to join you, Sean. Gary, good to see you all, too. Thank you. Hey, good John, you tell too. me, what are you doing in Las Vegas? Taking a little time out to play the tables on the slots? You know, I tell you what, I, I did all my gambling as a young man. In fact, as a boy, I used to gamble an awful lot between the ages of about 8 and 17, remarkably, and I was never any good at it. I learned my lesson early. So now that I've come to Las Vegas, no gambling. For me, it was only ever a one-way street. It was a quick ticket to poverty, and I figured that out young. <laughs> hey, well, oh, listen. Why am I here? Yeah, you are there for an, you. You are there for an important reason. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, not here, I'm not here only not to do something, but we're here to do something. As you well know, my friend, uh, for well over a year, it has written, partnering with the Nevada Utah Conference and ASI, have been planning an exciting series of meetings in Las Vegas. It starts tomorrow, tomorrow morning, and tomorrow night, Revelation Today. About four weeks of Bible studies dealing especially with the prophecies of the books of Daniel and Revelation. And so we're live in Las Vegas, and from Las Vegas, we're going to the entire world via television 
and by the internet. So we are just excited. This is, I, I think, uh, as you look around Las Vegas, this is a city where there's a lot of light or a lot of lights. But it's amazing how darkness that light can be. In fact, from where I'm sitting, I can see a couple of the, the best known casinos in Las Vegas. They're surrounding us where we are right now. But we're here to do something that I believe is going to have a lasting effect. We're preaching the word of God and sharing the Bible with Las Vegas and the world. And actually, viewers of Hope Channel can watch that tomorrow as well. That's carried live here on Hope Channel. You can join Pastor, uh, I almost called him Pastor Vegas. I almost got that wrong. You're not Pastor Vegas. You're Pastor Bradshaw in Vegas. Bradshaw in Vegas. Not uh, Pastor Vegas in Bradshaw. Yeah. Pastor Vegas in Bradshaw. You yeah, that might be the start of something. You yeah, you don't mind if I call you Pastor Vegas from now on, do you? Pastor Vegas from now on, do you? <laughs> you can call me anything you want. If that means my luck's going to change, you know, the, the devil didn't like us being here. We've had quite a few challenges since we've been here, but that's, that's typical for evangelism, I suppose. It sure is. And tomorrow you're actually going to talk about Matthew 24, aren't you? About Matthew 24, aren't you? Yes, we yeah. are. We're going to be talking about the very subject you're talking about tonight. Well, it's great. We're at a place called the Cashman Center, which is a, 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 an auditorium that seats about 2,000 people on the north end of town, a couple of miles beyond the Strip. It's really a well-known place, and we were here earlier in the year for a shorter event, so it's a great location. Um, I, I know we're going to have a great crowd. We just we're fired up about this. It's great. Okay, guys. Well, let's let's uh, let's get right back into the prophecy. We have 51 verses in about seven minutes, and uh, and the question is this: John and, and Gary, um, Jesus makes this announcement that the temple will be destroyed. In verse three, the disciples say, "Tell us when is this going to happen." And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? What do you guys think makes the disciples connect the dots this way? The temple's destroyed, the second coming must be taking place, or the Messianic age must be beginning. What makes them connect those dots? What makes them connect those dots? Well, it's so cataclysmic. I mean, you just imagine the whole temple being destroyed. They couldn't even fathom that. And here Jesus is predicting something that sounds like the end of the world. And so that's, uh, that's, that's what they're doing with it. Sure. John, John, why do you think sure. they John, connect the dots John, that way? I, I tend to agree. What do you think? I tend to agree. What do you think? You know, the, the Jewish identity was bound up in their, in their religious identity. They were God's people. The temple was given to them. This is who they were. We look at some of the, some of the things the disciples said. Well, at least I do. Jesus says, I'm going down there to die. I'm going to be crucified. And they're not getting it because they're thinking national greatness. There is no way this great nation God's own nation can be risen up. So the idea of the temple being destroyed for them, that just had to be the end of absolutely everything. It, they, their identity was bound up in it, and that was a symbol of their blessing of God and uh, the people that they were in the sight of God. They, they couldn't um, disassociate the two. Now, now you'll notice that Jesus doesn't disagree with them. He actually launches in and gives them the signs to watch for for his coming and, and the end of the world. And he tends to break them down into a, a number of very general categories. Some people say he gives them signs in the political world, he gives them signs in the religious world, he gives them signs in the natural or sort of geographical world. And, uh, and uh, it unpacks for a few verses right here from verse 4 onward. Um, let me ask you a question. These things that, um, that Jesus predicts, are these things that we could be watching for now? What are some of the things that he tells us to look for? Well, I think he's, he's saying things that happened back in that first century as signs leading up to the destruction of the temple, but using that as a model, a symbol of what would happen in the last days as well. So one of the things is Matthew 24, 5. Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. Right. Well, we have sure seen a lot of that over the years. I mean, you have David Koresh and, and many others who've done this. And it seems to be a rising number of them. I mean, there have always been one or two of these people in history. I was reading about one around the year 1000 a while ago, a guy in Egypt who claimed to be God. But, you know, I, I, it seems to be there's one in a century or one in a millennium. And in the last few decades, say the last 50, 60 years, there have been more than a thousand You just here in North America. And not just kook jobs that are in a mental hospital. These are people that actually have followings. People buy what they say. I met some people in the mall the other day during the holiday season, and if I would follow them, I'd get a ticket to Korea to meet God herself. Oh, God herself. God no herself, herself actually, actually, yes. Uh, John, what else does Jesus point out here? I mean, there's clearly false religion. We've got our fill of it, the world's sick of religion. False religion, false Christ. What are some of the other things that, uh, that Jesus tells us to watch for in this prophecy? 
It's interesting he talks about natural disasters. That's one thing. I guess we could stop and sit on that for a while, couldn't we? He talks about earthquakes. He talks about famines. He talks about pestilences. What I find interesting is Jesus is talking about, he's talking about some uh, phenomena that have always been around. But he says, and, and perhaps you're going to get to this, he says in Matthew 24 and verse 8, all of these are the beginnings of sorrows. And that word sorrows means something like birth pains. He says these are like birth Wait, pains. Let me pause so, you on that. That's very important. There were people a thousand years ago talking about the fact that they were God, but now we've got so many of them. I was talking to an epidemiologist friend the other day about the, uh, the rise in diseases. And so now we have, we have AIDS. There's no cure yet. We hope there will be. We have the oddball diseases like Ebola and SARS and other things like this. And then the massive rise in things like um, heart disease. Some cancer numbers are down, thank God, but others are up. Uh, diabetes is exploding. 26 million Americans have diabetes and 50 plus million are pre-diabetic. And then there's uh, instances of obesity, depression, and other mental illnesses that are through the roof. So when you stop and think about some of these signs Jesus was talking about, and he was saying they will increase the closer we get to the end. My goodness, if we're not nearly there yet, I, I hate to see what it's going to look like when we are. So it's not that these things haven't happened in the past, you're saying. Jesus compares them to birth pangs, to labor pains. That's what that word sorrows is, literally. I think if I remember the, the original language, boy, I'm going to have to stretch to remember. I think it's the word odin or, or something like that. I'll trust you on Do that. not. If you have a complaint about my Greek, please address your letters to Gary Gibbs, Hope <laughs> Channel. Uh, he's responsible for my Greek skills this evening. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, it's birth pangs. That means these things have happened, but as the, just like when you're having a baby, I've never had one, but I've noticed people having babies, like my wife, as those contractions get stronger and closer together, then you know you're getting closer to the big moment. More frequent, more intense. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing happen in the world. But listen, let me ask you guys this. I mean, people say, ah, earthquakes, we've always had earthquakes. Um, and, uh, and how do we really know that there's more of them? Is there any evidence to suggest that those things are increasing? You know, there's always going to be someone who will tell you, no, we've always had them, and all we have these days is better detection methods. And I should have this statistic, but I think the, la the five largest earthquakes in history, oh, someone will hang me up for this, but <clears throat> many, a great percentage of the largest earthquakes in history that we know of have happened in the last 50 years. And these days, with population centers being so much more dense, um, it doesn't take quite as much for an earthquake to wipe out a couple of hundred thousand people like happened recently in Haiti. So, you know, there's going to be someone who will, who will take some statistics and say, oh, it, it, you know, it is. My, my honest conviction is that the, the prevalence of earthquakes today, if you look at it and the amount of large earthquakes striking large um, population centers, there's a lot of them. It seems to me they're increasing. And that's backed by science. I mean, the scientists who study this tell us, even in our recent decades and centuries, they, they are saying it's more frequent, a lot more of them, and stronger. Something's going on. Something's happening. Now, in, in just a moment, we're going to throw your questions into the mix so that I get to hear what you're thinking about this subject. And when we come back, just before we get to your questions, I want to just look at one verse in particular where it talks about the abomination of desolation because that's going to tie this chapter directly to the book of Daniel, which is kind of the platform for this program, at least in the weeks that are coming. What is the abomination of desolation? I'll ask my guests in just a moment, and then we're going to get to your questions right after we answer that question, and we're going to get a lot accomplished in a very short time. I'll be right back. Don't change the channel. You are watching Disclosure. And we're back. And in a few moments, it's going to be time to open up the discussion to everybody who's watching. So here's how you can do that. Go to hopetv.org disclosure, and you'll find a lot of details there. You can call me at 888-730-HOPE or 4673. Send me a text message, 707-200-1099. And in just a moment, we'll get to your questions, but we left off talking about the abomination of desolation. It's in verse 15, and you made reference to this, Gary, at the head of the program. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea, verse 16, flee to the mountains. What is the abomination of desolation? What's he talking about? I'll jump, I'll jump in here, if I may, but... 
you, you go to Daniel, you'll find the abomination of desolation mentioned multiple times, even from chapter 1 when the Babylonian forces destroyed Jerusalem. When Daniel's praying about that event later in Daniel 9, he talks about the temple that has been desolated. Now, if you study that out, you go to 2 Chronicles 36, it tells the whole story. And it uses these two words, abomination and desolation, in reference to the temple multiple times. And what it is, Sean, is simply this. The, when the believers in God, the true God, the Israelites in this case, turned their worship from the way God said to worship Him in purity, keeping His law in, in the pure way, and they started adapting and adopting the pagan worship practices. They took those abominations and brought them into the temple. God said, I can't be with you in that worship. And he left it. And when he withdrew from them, then that opened them up for judgment and attacks. And that's what caused the desolation. So that's the abomination that made desolate the first temple. But then okay. you have the other two temples mentioned. In the right. Prophecy. Well, this one in specific, we're talking about the destruction of the temple. Was there an instance, you guys, uh, John or Gary, in which there was an abomination of desolation again just before the sack of Jerusalem? Well, you had people, I was giving John a opportunity. I don't know, if John, John are there. you still there in Las Vegas or did, you, did he take off? Oh, there he is. No, I, I haven't been bewitched by the bright lights and the, 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 the twinkling <laughs> signs, but I know that Gary's literally written the book on this, so I'm, okay. just, I'm just sitting here and enjoying well, his, uh, over his to you, breakdown Gary. of this prophecy. Well, the abominations were, you read them there in the New Testament. Now, instead of going after the pagan uh, worship practices, they had created their own false worship, a legalistic worship system that didn't believe in grace, and they, in doing that, again, forfeited God's protection so much so that the Romans come in and they actually plant their standards and they worship right there in that spot. In fact, Jesus says in the parallel passage to this over in Luke chapter 21, verse 20, he says, right. the armies of Rome, when they sur surround Jerusalem, then you know that this has happened. Right, an idolatrous standard inside the holy grounds right. of Jerusalem. And there's a take-home lesson for us, and I think as we study Daniel in coming weeks, it's going to become pretty obvious as we start to unpack the prophecies a little more deeply. By, by the way, Sean, yeah. John mentioned my little booklet, yeah. and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to share that with all your viewers tonight. We'll send it to them if they email you. We can just mail, email it right out to them. It have to be by email, though. Okay, so it's actually a, a, a digital book, that they, a digital manuscript. A whole that they study can on this one text. Phenomenal. Okay, time for the questions because we don't want to shortchange everybody who wants to join the discussion out there in TV land. Um, and uh, our first question was texted to us, and it says this, guys. If we didn't believe in the New Testament, as many Jews don't, wouldn't it be a requirement to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and obey God? So... I mean, from a Jewish perspective, wouldn't the temple have to be rebuilt? I'm assuming that's what the question is asking. We as Christians don't see the need for it but because we read the New Testament, but wouldn't Jews see the need to rebuild the temple? And uh, wouldn't that be cause to believe, I guess, that the temple has to be rebuilt? Let's let John jump on that one. Hey, John, why don't you jump on that from Las Vegas? Does the temple have to be rebuilt? I'll do it. For, I mean, from a Jewish perspective, <clears throat> perhaps, I, you know, I've got to be honest and say it's hard for me to speak in behalf of all of the, all of the Jews in the world. But if I was a Jew and, and my worship had been, had been stripped away from me, that some of the, the key principles of my worship style or worship form, I think, yes, I would want to see a temple rebuilt. And I believe there are many Jews in the world today who are living in the expectation or at least in the hope that the temple will be rebuilt. For a Jew, the temple was the very center of who they were and how they worshiped God. And that was destroyed in 70 AD and hasn't existed uh, in the intervening 2,000 years almost, so perhaps. However, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a theoretical question. We're, we're dealing, we do have the New Testament. The question was if we didn't have the New Testament, we do. Uh, it's very interesting. You mentioned the writing of the book of Hebrews, and Paul, at least I think Paul, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, I think Paul wrote that book just a few years before Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed, and he emphasized again and again and again the priesthood that matters is the heavenly priesthood, not an earthly priesthood. The temple that matters is a heavenly temple and not an earthly temple. Yeah. So for us today, we are glad that there is a temple that has been built. It's in heaven, and there's a high priest whose name is Jesus. I'll give you a quick text, I think, that just demolishes that, that uh, idea that the temple has to be rebuilt. Daniel 9, verse 26, when he predicts the destruction of the city and the sanctuary. This is the right. this prediction right. of what we're reading. Jesus predicted in Matthew 24. 
Then he says, the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And what he's saying there is that desolations will continue in the original language until the end, the end of time. That's why Israel is a war-torn country. It will always be that because of this. It's so we actually have an Old Testament all. reference to the fact that it's going it's to be It's not going desolate. to be rebuilt. That's right. Amazing. All right. We have a YouTube question from Gitesh. Uh, Gitesh, welcome to the program tonight. What is your question? Coming in by YouTube. Hey, Sean. I'm wondering about the earthquakes. Would the number of earthquakes be a sign or would the intensity be a sign? All right. What matters when it comes to counting earthquakes? How many there are or how strong they are? What do you think, guys? I think that they are. <laughs> because that's, Jesus didn't say numbers or intensity. He said that they are, that they're going to be there. And I think it's both, really. It, it's, there's more of them. They're more intense. And it's to get people's attention. You know, when this stuff happens, you stop and you say, what's going on? It, we talked right. earlier about being in control of our environment. We're out of control of our environment. So what is happening? And then we say, you know, this ancient book talked about that. I wonder if there's some information there that will help make sense of this. Okay, John, what say you about earthquakes? The number of earthquakes or how strong they are? What matters? I don't think too many people would get too excited. If there was one 9.0 earthquake every 150 years, we'd say life is just going on. But look around the world today. Um, the earthquakes are all over the place and, and they're, they're big and bad. It seems to me, in the absence of a specific reference to this end, that what Jesus was talking about was both the frequency and the uh, intensity. That's why he used the, the birth pains motif, if you like. You know, it's interesting that not only do we have frequency but intensity in the last few years. I think the earthquake that caused the first Asian tsunami in the last decade, the one that, you know, wiped out beaches in Southeast Asia and mm -hmm. so on, I think that was the biggest earthquake ever recorded. I, I could be wrong, or at least it was close, mm -hmm. and it left something like an 800-kilometer gash mm -hmm. in the bottom of the ocean. And, of course, the one that caused the Japanese tsunami was, uh, was huge, too. Mm -hmm. We got one more question from YouTube. We're going to ask it, and then we're going to take a break to answer more of your questions about Matthew 24. But let's look at the question, and then we're going to come right back. Who are the elect mentioned verse 21 and 24? Why does the Bible use the word, and how could the elect be the sign? All right. Well, who are the elect? They're mentioned in Matthew chapter 24. And, uh, of course, they're a group that does very well in all of this, and you kind of want to be a part of that group. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come right back and look at the elect in Matthew chapter 24 and look at more of your questions. Hang in there. We're coming right back. All right, our YouTube question is, who are the elect? They're mentioned at least once, I think maybe even twice in Matthew chapter 24. Um, and, uh, and the question is, who are they? Obviously, we'd want to know who they are because we'd love to be one of them. And uh, John, what say you? Who are the elect in Matthew chapter 24? Chapter 24. The simple answer is they are the people of God. I'll give you a couple of verses for this. Okay. Uh, Luke chapter 18 and verse 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he be along with them. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, and so on. There's really no mystery about this. It, the answer is, as it sounds like it is, God's people, those who have chosen Christ, are his elect. If you get away from that, what you've got is some special group that God has specially chosen. They're the hand-picked elite that you and I perhaps might not be able to be a part of. But you see, when you choose Christ, he, he, I shouldn't say he chooses you because he chose you in the first place. But those who've given their lives to Christ and accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, God's people, Jesus' special ones are the elect. Now, there is a vein of thought that says that the elect are people that God did pick ahead of time, That's uh, right. either for or against them. John, I completely agree with what you said, but do we have biblical evidence to suggest that the elect actually have a decision whether or not they're elect? I, I think so. Yeah, if I can jump in on this one, it's uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, second, verse 10. Second, second Peter 1, verse 10. 2 Peter 1. Shows that the decision-making process of this election is actually on the part of the believer themselves. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. So the elect are those who don't stumble. The elect are the victorious ones. 
but they're doing things to make sure that they're victorious. So it, it puts the ball back in the believer's court. God doesn't force people into exactly. the kingdom of heaven. So if you don't do those things, you'll stumble. And I like what Jesus said right after the text in verse 24 about the elect. Verse 25, see, I've told you beforehand. So he right. says, I'm giving you information, and if you act on that information, then you're the elect, man. You've got the inside information. You know what to do. You're safe. You're good. Okay, guys, next question. It came in text message. With all the talk about wars and rumors of wars, do you think the Bible predicts the end of humanity through nuclear warfare? There you go. Is somebody going to push the button at long last and, uh, and blow up the world? Is that the calamity that's coming upon us? Is that how it all ends? Is that where Jesus is pointing with Matthew 24? I mean, the Romans sacked the temple. That was pretty uh, catastrophic. Is it a nuclear bomb or a bunch of them in the end? Well, it, it, you know, it's, it's not a nuclear bomb. Jesus comes. That's the end of the world. And it's a glorious event to every believer. We're not all going to be fried. But you know, it's interesting. I think it's in 2 Peter chapter 3, where it talks about when Jesus comes. It says the elements will melt with fervent heat. It's in 2 Peter 3 verse 10. That word elements actually is atom in the original language. So will there be some nuclear <laughs> explosions? Yes, but it's going to come when Jesus comes. He comes as flaming fire, and it ignites the elements of the earth. But those who love Jesus have given their lives to him, they're ready for it, and they're safe. Okay, guys, but how do we know Jesus doesn't just come to mop up after we kill ourselves off? I mean, is there anything in the Bible to suggest there's anybody around when he comes? John? Oh, yes. You know, way back in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 9, the Bible says it will be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. The, the Bible makes clear again and again and again that Jesus is coming back for a group of people who are looking for him. You know, we look towards the end with hope. Jesus talked in Luke chapter 21 about the signs of the times. And he said, when you see these things come to pass, lift up your head, look up because your redemption draws nigh. But you get over into the Pauline epistles. And Paul wrote this, he said, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So it is going to end with a big bang. That's for real. But that <laughs> big bang is when Jesus comes back. I like to think there'll be a sonic boom when he enters Earth's atmosphere. And those of us who've waited long and prayed earnestly and looked uh, wishfully and uh, hopefully to Jesus' return, we're going up. Gravity's going to lose power over the soles of our feet. Man, the best is yet to come. But no mushroom cloud. No mushroom cloud. Well, who's to say? Who's to say there's not going to be? But not the nuclear mushroom cloud that devastates the planet. We're not all going to. We're not all going to melt. Jesus is coming back, and some of us are going up in one piece. Praise the Lord. Well, and and the Bible says in Revelation one verse seven that every eye will see him. So you right. know there are people alive watching. It's not carcasses. Exactly. Okay, we're going to see him. We got Felix on YouTube. Felix, welcome to Disclosure. What's your question for my guest tonight? Hey Sean, is the direction of lighting in verse 27 significant? And if so, why? Okay, well that is a phenomenal question. Verse 27 of Matthew 24, let me, let me read that. As the lightning comes from the east, now I'm not sure which way is east here in the studio, but I'll, I'll pretend it's this way. As the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So it goes from east to west. Does that mean anything? Is the east important in the Bible? Well, I, I think the first meaning here is the obvious one. Every eye is going to see them. As lightning fills the sky from horizon to horizon and everybody sees it, that's the way it's going to be when Jesus comes. I mean, in verse 30, he says, All the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man. And I think why this is significant Sean, is because there's a lot of teaching out there that says there is a secret rapture. When Jesus comes, only the believers see him, and they're whisked out of here, and then everybody else is left saying, oh, what happened? The Bible says when Jesus comes, it's the cataclysmic end. Every eye sees him. From the east to the west, I'll let John cover whether John, the direction is significant. Any idea why Jesus comes from the east? I was really hoping you'd leave that one for me, Gary. That's that's that's, that's, that's specialty of mine. What, what are friends for, John? What are friends for? John, what are friends for? There is there is a reason, and the reason is there's no reason. What I mean is this: Jesus was simply picking on a, a well-known atmospheric phenomenon. The idea of lightning coming out of the east and shooting across to the west was was well known to the Jewish mind. This was something that his audience could relate to and 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 get. But as for the east to the west, no. He's coming back. You're going to see him. You won't miss him. It won't be a secret. 
It's going to be like lightning. You know something? I remember being in a little town in Kentucky holding a series of meetings in Ohio County. Okay, John, it's going to have to be a short story. It was night. My eyes were shut. I was facing the wall. The curtains were pulled. And when the lightning flashed, I still saw it. You are not going to miss Jesus when Amen. he comes back. You're not. And you shouldn't want to. You know, it's interesting to me. I don't want to disagree with my esteemed guests, but it's interesting to me that after the first temple was destroyed, that salvation for the Jews and the ability to rebuild their temple the first time came from the east. A king came mm -hmm. from the east. Cyrus was from the east, well known that he'd mm -hmm. come from the east, and he was called anointed, not which is Mashiach, Messiah. Mm -hmm. Not that he was the Messiah, but he pointed forward to Jesus. And it may be in this passage uh, that uh, we're just hearkening back to an event like that where salvation came from the east. I can't believe we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I can't believe that's it. We're going to have to go back and look at this again. In just a moment, I'll be back with a few more thoughts on Matthew, the 24th chapter. John, Gary, thank you very much. The rest of you, don't you go away. Well, next week, I've changed my mind about what we're going to cover. I think we're going to pick up where we left off because there's so much in Matthew 24 that we could talk about. We really didn't have enough time, and it's foundational for the book of Daniel. You know, Jesus compares the final death throes of a world gone wrong to a woman giving birth in Matthew chapter 24. The catastrophic events, he says, are the beginning of sorrows, or literally, as Pastor John pointed out, birth pangs. They're contractions, and that means the bigger they get, and the more frequent they become, the closer we are to the second coming of Christ. And really, if you think about it, it's great news. It means that God knows there's something wrong with our world. He knows that we're down here suffering, and His promise is that He's going to do something about it. You know, sometimes it's easy to get wrapped up in the death and destruction when you're studying prophetic books like Daniel and Revelation. But you know, the death and destruction, that's not really the point. The point of childbirth, after all, isn't the pain. The point of childbirth isn't the contractions. The point of childbirth is the baby that's born and the joy that comes with it. Just listen to the words of Jesus found in John chapter 16. Listen to what he says. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, Jesus said, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. That's one of my favorite passages. It really is. It tells me that God sees us here. He knows that we're suffering. He knows something's wrong, and He wants to set it straight. So let me ask you this. Why does God let this world fall apart? Really, it's because He's making way for a new one, a world without pain or suffering or crying or death. You know something? If you're getting tired of this world, if you're getting tired of pain and suffering, you're invited to the next world. I'm Sean Boonstra, and you've been watching Disclosure.